Do you see a, a PowerPoint presentation? Yes. Okay. So yesterday we were talking about uh, uh, BEC very generally and about uh, cooling things. We discovered that Doppler cooling is a clever idea, but it doesn't get us cold enough. Um, there's a, 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 an advanced kind of laser cooling known as Sisyphus cooling. Sometimes it's called polarization gradient cooling. If you're a purist who really studies different kinds of laser cooling, you will think, oh, polarization gradient cooling and Sisyphus cooling are entirely different, but I, I can't tell the difference. I see them as almost identical. Um, and uh, of course, Sisyphus uh, from, the, from the mythology is the guy who is doomed to continually push by the, he, he, he somehow angered the gods. I don't remember how it's not difficult to anger the gods and they condemned him to rock up a, a mountain. And every time he got close to the top of the mountain, the rock fell down to the bottom and he had to push it up again. In many ways, uh, a perfect uh, metaphor for experimental physics. So I can see why it appealed to so many people. These days I sometimes think that uh, I like this drawing because it reminds me that we almost get COVID uh, suppressed and then there's a new variation and the COVID uh, virus appears down at the bottom of the mountain again. Um, this idea of polarization cooling is a, a little more complicated than Doppler cooling, but I think super interesting. Um, it's the idea of two laser beams coming in from opposite directions and uh, the laser beams have uh, some detuning. They're detuned, their detuning is less than zero, their detuning is red. And one has a uh, polarization, the electric field up, and the other has the polarization, let's draw it, this is supposed to be into the page, orthogonal. So where, when the two laser beams uh, intersect with each other, there's a standing wave, and it's not a standing wave of intensity because the, you know, the two different uh, electric fields can't cancel each other out. Instead, it's a standing wave of polarization depending on the relative phase, which changes spatially. So as you, travel along in space in this direction, you have linear polarization and then circular polarization in the opposite direction. And basically it keeps oscillating back and forth as you go in uh, the, the helicity of the polarization oscillates back and forth as you move along. If now you have a, a more realistic atom, an atom which has some hyperfine structure so that its ground state has a finite uh, sorry, non, non, uh, a, a finite F. So in this case, I've drawn the simplest atom for which this can work F equal one half and, and the excited state has F equal three halves. Uh, and if my atom is right here, and if my laser beam is detuned red, then uh, those are the two transitions that can happen depending on the, the circular polarization drives only these delta N equal plus one transitions. And because they're detuned red, there's an AC Stark shift. Now it happens to be that if you have lower angular momentum in one, in one state and higher angular momentum in the other state, uh, there are, call them clutch gordon coefficients, dipole matrix elements. This is, a, this is a stronger transition, this one on the right, so that this state gets pushed down more and this state gets pushed down less. So that this state is lower in energy. If uh, we go a little bit further along until we're here at this point in space, the opposite applies. Now the polarization of the laser beam that the atoms encounter is in this direction. And the transition, which is what we call the stretch transition, uh, pointing from the n equal minus one half to the n equal minus three half, that's a stronger transition. And so it gets, it, it's AC stock shift is correspondingly large. So imagine we start with an atom right here and it has a velocity in this direction. It's because it's sitting there in circular polarization. If the atom happens to start um, initially, let's imagine the atom starts initially here in this state, it will get optically pumped. That, uh, that did not appear, did it? It will get optically pumped um, by the polarization. It will go, uh, it will go up and then it will come down here. And so before too long, the atom will be in this state. Now, if the atom is moving, the atom moves along happily on and the potential will change. 
we draw the potential of the n equal one half state as being a minimum here. And then it goes up to a maximum and down to a minimum and up to a maximum as the polarization goes from uh, sigma plus to sigma minus and back again. On the other hand, the, the energy of the, of the minus one half state has the opposite effect. Its energy uh, oscillates in the uh, uh, oscillates in, in position space in the in the opposite direction. If the atom starts here in the lowest of the two uh, hyperfine states and starts to move along, you can see that it's moving up a, a potential hill. It moves up a potential hill until it gets where it's moved along in this direction, and now it's it's here. And the effect of the optical pumping is in the opposite direction, and so the optical pumping will excite the atom up in this direction and it will decay down to here. On this diagram, I can draw that as if the uh, molecule has undergone an optical transition, and now suddenly, sorry, the atom has undergone an optical transition, and now the atom is down here. This difference in energy is energy which is taken away by the, by the photon, because the photon that comes in here is, uh, is redder, and the photon which is emitted is bluer, and the difference between those two photon energies is energy which is taken away from the atom because the atom had to roll up this hill. And like poor old Sisyphus, as the atom rolls up to the top, he almost gets to the top of the hill and now the boulder winds up down at the bottom. And if the atom continues moving in this direction, the process, uh, the process continues. Now he rolls up here and again, he undergoes a transition and gradually this energy is removed from the atom and, and the atoms get colder and colder. So this is Sisyphus cooling. The effect of, uh, call it, um, it, it can cool down to uh, some small number, three or four times the recoil energy. The recoil energy, remember, is the momentum of a photon divided by the mass of the atom. And so this is the uh, temperature limit of Sisyphus cooling. And this temperature is, for rubidium, this is maybe three microkelvin. Uh, it depends a little bit on the on the situation. This is a much much lower temperature than the Doppler temperature, which is only which was 200 microkelvin. So we now become a factor of 100 colder. Why doesn't it go down even lower? Well, as always, and this applies to many many optical cooling problems. At the very end, you know, you wind up with the atom in the excited state, and it emits a photon, and that photon can go in a random direction. It's hard to get that last little bit of energy, approximately one recoil of energy out. There are exceptions to this, but uh, it's, it's not easy. And this particular method doesn't have, doesn't have a solution for that. Um, this method works in, in complicated uh, three-dimensional polarizations. You know, if you have your laser beams coming in. Eric, you have a question in the chat? Yes. Sorry, think... Yes, good. Thank you, Anna Maria. For characterization, is the F equal three halves here the hyperfine of the excited electronic state or the upper hyperfine component of the ground state? Excellent question. Yeah, this, uh, it is in fact, the F equal three halves is in a electron excited state. I realize that it does look like the upper hyperfine. And this is, uh, um, there are, uh, this is basically, what I'm looking at is a portion of the, hype, uh, a portion, a fraction of the hyperfine manifold of the, of the lower ground state and a, a fraction of the hyperfine manifold of the, of the upper excited state. Yeah, good question. It does look a little bit like I'm in the ground state of, a, of an F equal three half, F equal one half ground uh, atom, yeah. Could I ask a related question? You may. Which is the, the decay back down is spontaneous, right? So presumably it could end back in the state that it started. It just, yes. we're just relying yeah. on uh, some fraction of them or most of them to go into the lower energy state. Yeah, uh, okay. the ones that go back down into the original state, mm -hmm. that's sort of a, a, a no-op from the point of view of cooling. You, the photon goes in with one energy, comes back with the same energy. Right. So there may be some recoil kick from it, but there's none of this sort of discontinuous change in the AC Stark shift energy. So it's not a particularly important effect. I but see. it does represent a competing and heating effect. This, uh, it's just that over time, when the atom does finally make its way and eventually will always make its way to the state, now it can only go there and it will never go back to the other state. So that's its ultimate destination, but it may take, it may have to scatter two or three photons to get there. I see. Thank you. Um, so this works. Uh, 
it works that even in the presence, if you can imagine that if you have laser beams coming in from all different directions, and instead of the laser beams being linearly polarized, they're all circularly polarized, as they would be if you were trying to make a, a magneto-optical trap. And in that case, the polarization in the space is going to have a very complicated spatially dependent uh, form, spatially dependent in all three directions. It just turns out that very generally, very generally, uh, you can you decide, low, it's hard to even decide what your local quantization axis is, but very generally, the state with the, uh, uh, the, the, the larger negative AC Stark shift is also the state which uh, tend, the atoms are tend to optically pump to. As long as, call this, uh, uh, this is F for the, um, for the ground state, this is F for the excited state. As long as F in the excited state is larger than F in the ground state, uh, the, the Sisyphus cooling uh, works, works well in 3D, which is important because we live in 3D. Um, there, are, there are limits. Uh, you need to have uh, the magnetic field must be small because the effect of the magnetic field would be to basically cause Larmor rotation so that the M equal one half and minus one half states could, could rotate into each other depending on the direction of the magnetic field with respect to the direction of the local K vector. So B needs to be small and also uh, V needs to be small. The initial V even before the cooling starts because if you had a high initial velocity, um, an atom could would travel here so fast, if it's traveling too fast, it could go from one local minimum of M equal one half state to the next local minimum of the M equal one half state before the time for the optical pumping to happen. The optical pumping happens at the spontaneous emission rate. And as was just pointed out, it often requires multiple spontaneous events and it cannot be driven at the saturated rate. So it takes some finite amount of time. And so it works out that unless the atoms are already pretty cold, already less than two or three millikelvin, probably, this advanced form of cooling doesn't work, which is fine because you can have basically both forms of cooling working at once, the Doppler cooling, which works at relatively high temperatures and the Sisyphus cooling uh, once the atoms are cold enough. So this is basically how these things, how uh, uh, things get cold in many, many experiments. Um, it's, it, I find it sort of amusing to think a little bit sometimes um, in sort of de generic terms about cooling. For instance, we're doing this exotic cooling. Uh, how, are we, how are we doing with respect to the most possible efficient cooling? We know that there's a, uh, basically if we are, uh, we have a, have some box and it's at temperature C, we can put some, some work into it. And if we have some sort of heat engine, that work can go up there plus some cooling energy, which I'll call EC, up to some higher energy. And so we've extracted, we've moved heat, we can move heat from the cold to the hot. The efficiency of this process, eta, okay, that was a terrible eta, let me try again. Eta, which is basically the cooling energy over the work done to get that cooling energy in the limit of uh, T hot, much, much greater than T cold. This, this, the Carnot efficiency, the theoretically maximum you can do is T cold over T hot. Okay, but let us remember that we live in a 300 Kelvin environment and these atoms have cooled down to perhaps uh, three micro Kelvin. So this is, uh, the best the efficiency can possibly be, three, uh, three micro Kelvin over 300 Kelvin, what does that work out to? Um, 10 to the minus eight. So you might think, oh, this is terrible. This is terrible cooling. But remember, there's no option here. There's no, there's no alternative. If we're doing the cooling, we have to result, we have to you know, resolve that, yes, we're gonna have to put in eight orders of magnitude more work in order to extract this energy. On the other hand, the cooling we're trying to do is some small number, perhaps a million or 10 million atoms, and, and, and the cooling might be changing its temperature from, from 
20 microkelvin to 5 microkelvin. I haven't worked out the numbers, but I imagine we're talking sort of attowatts, maybe, or, or, or certainly not more than femtowatts of energy. So even if you multiply that by 10 to the 8, it sounds, it's not so bad. Um, but uh, it's worth asking the question, can we actually do as well? Are we actually getting anywhere near the Carnot efficiency? Um, and perhaps we're doing better. After all, um, when I saw the Carnot efficiency derived, it was with like these pistons and cylinders that compress and heat flows. It's very, very 19th century. Now we have lasers. Um, lasers are much more powerful than pistons. I don't think that the Carnot efficiency should apply to lasers. So let's see if it does. Um, Let's imagine that we have a, a little box. Inside the box, we have an atom, and we put in a photon. This is our work. Uh, the work is we generate a photon and we throw it in there. Um, that work is actually amazingly efficient. We can generate lasers can be, you know, uh, solid state lasers, maybe 80% 80, 80 efficient. So like, if we are putting in a watt of photons, you know, maybe that's only 1.3 watts of power coming out of the wall. It's actually, that work is, that's not the problem, making the photons, that's quite efficient. And that photon bounces off of our atom and gets absorbed on the walls of our chamber, which are at 300 Kelvin equals T hot. So um, what is the change in the energy of the atom? Well, the initial energy of the atom is its momentum squared over twice its mass. And the final energy, if we do everything perfectly, it's going to be the momentum, it's the initial momentum minus uh, the momentum of the photon squared over 2 ma. And so that's equal to, uh, roughly speaking, the momentum of the atom times the momentum of the photon over m. I have received many complaints about my handwriting um, that have come in on various, and I, I am trying much harder today, and I hope you appreciate that, even though it's still terrible, I'm gonna fix that T hot. It's much better than it was yesterday. So think of this as a differential uh, improvement, if not actually an objective, objectively good handwriting yet. Okay. Um, Put in a couple more empty slides. So uh, the cooling energy, let's, see, let's put this in again. Cooling energy is, cooling is uh, the momentum of the atom times the momentum of the photon over twice the mass of the atom. The work is equal to the energy of the photon which is equal to C times the momentum of the photon. So our efficiency eta is the cooling energy over uh, the work is just equal to the momentum of the atom. We're gonna ignore factors of, of two times uh, MC. So that's our efficiency. Is that a, is that a good efficiency? or a bad efficiency. Let's compare it to, to, to the uh, Carnot efficiency, eta over eta Carnot. Our eta is Ca over M. Oh, sorry, I need a C here. Oh, did I get that right? Yeah. Uh, so it's Pa over M over Tc over T hot. Um, Let's see. We can write that. We can write the momentum of the atom as two times the mass of the atom times the cold temperature. That's roughly speaking. That's going to be the a typical momentum for a for a, an atom in our cold in the cold part uh, over M C over T cold over T hot. We end up getting this is equal to. T hot squared over uh, cold and C squared. So, so you might think, um, okay, that seems, that's a number. Is that number, 
this after uh, the mc squared is the uh, relativistic energy i guess you could relativistic estimates resonance so you could might ask yourself is that greater than or less than one are we doing better than carnot or, or worse than carnot um we should remember though that uh for let's see for sisyphus cooling ignoring factors of order a few cc is equal to uh the momentum of the photon squared over uh, the mass of the atom. So if we, we put it all together, I'll skip a few, a few steps, eta over eta C uh, goes as, uh, let's see, it's C hot squared over P gamma squared, C squared, that's just the energy of the photon. So that's just the T hot over the energy, basically, H nu, HF of the photon. Now we can ask the question, is that greater than or less than one? Well, you might think, well, there's no problem here. We'll just make our, we'll find an atom. Most atoms, the energy difference between the excited state and the ground state works out to about yeah, 15,000 Kelvin, but not always. We'll just find a specialized atom where the energy difference between the, there's an allowed, between the ground state, there's an allowed excited state, which is only, let's say it's like, 250 Kelvin in, 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 in those units above. You might think, oh, great. Now we have created, we've beaten the Carnot efficiency, which is very exciting. And I've never liked thermo classical thermodynamics. It was always too hard for me. And I've always thought that this is ridiculous. This is 19th century. Let's see if we can't beat it. And sure enough, we think, okay. So we come in here with a photon, E gamma. Say it's, uh, say it's only 200 Kelvin. And it bounces off of the atom and it comes up here and we get a cooling efficiency, which is better than the uh, um, Carnot efficiency. Unfortunately, and you could probably all see this coming, there are other photons in the problem. The walls around our chamber are emitting black body photons with energy uh, E gamma black body have energy about 300 Kelvin and also about 200 Kelvin. So we have many photons coming in from all possible directions and our atom will also absorb those. And that will be an enormous random momentum walk and he, uh, an enormous source of heating. So, uh, nope, we must, we must operate in a regime where E gamma is much, much greater than uh, T hot. Uh, uh, so. Eric, there is a question in the chat too. Mm -hmm. Kano is saved. I'm sad about it, frankly, but what can we do? Question in the chat. Let's see if I can find the chat. Here it is. I want to clarify something. Strictly speaking, shouldn't the Carnot efficiency of a refrigerator be TC over T hot minus TC? Since TC is much, much less than T hot, one can approximate as TC over T hot. Exactly correct. Yes, I, mean, I simplified TC over TH minus TC and I said that's equal to TC over TH just because we are at a limit where TC, where T hot is um, you know, 10 to the nine times larger than T hot, uh, T cold. Thank you. Okay, so we're all a little disappointed that we have to still have to live with these stupid 19th century restrictions. You know, Victorian morals, Victorian physics, what the hell are we gonna do? But we have to, we have to push through. Um, Actually, it's almost irrelevant because there are very, very, very few atoms that have allowed dipole transitions whose energy is 300 Kelvin apart. But there are many molecules. Um, there are many, many molecules that have, uh, let's see. Molecules have vibrational levels. I'll just draw on the vibrational levels and the vibrational levels have rotational levels. And it turns out that the spacing between uh, vibrational levels, call it E vibrational, is often very close to 300 Kelvin, or at least not that much larger or smaller. And it's kind of interesting, for, for years we were able to get away with something, which is we would have our atom. Uh, I've done experiments where I have an atom close to, we had a sapphire chip. We actually heated the sapphire chip up to 500 Kelvin. And then we had a sample of atoms at 20 nano Kelvin. And the spacing between the atoms and the chip was about five microns. So we had a, a temperature gradient of whatever that works out to 10 orders of magnitude 
across a spacing of five microns, which is really quite extraordinary. How do we get away with it? Several ways. One is the vacuum is very, very good. That's extremely important. The other is that that 500 Kelvin, sur Kelvin surface is emitting black body radiation. It's extremely powerful. It's emitting a kilowatt, actually, because it's hotter. It's actually multiple kilowatts per square meter uh, blasting at this atom. But the atom has no allowed transitions in that frequency range, and so they blast right through. However, molecules do. And as we go into the world, into a world where uh, ultra cold molecules are not as important as ultra cold atoms, but gaining importance, and, and ultra cold molecules is an area of intense interest, suddenly we have to worry about this. It helps that uh, you know the spontaneous spontaneous emission rate uh, has. You know, so it starts off going as the frequency cubed, uh, and then there's uh, corrections for the size of the dipole uh, moment, and so. Uh, and then, okay, spontaneous emission. The one thing, absorption of black body is more or less the inverse process of spontaneous emission. And it also is very slow, even in the limit where the, um, you have a very large number of photons per mode. So for instance, the, the, these rotational levels here, there are allowed electric uh, dipole transitions between the rotational levels, but those frequencies are very, very small. And even though you have many black body photons per microwave mode uh, at 300 Kelvin, the rate for absorbing a black body photon by a, a molecule, a rotating molecule, often is hours. Uh, however, the rate for absorbing a, a, a black body photon into a vibrating molecule could easily be uh, one or two seconds, kind of depends on the particular case. In an experiment we're doing in my lab, we had to cool the experiment from 300 Kelvin down to 200 Kelvin. And you might think that's not very important, but it turned out that 300 Kelvin was already a little bit smaller than the vibrational energy and 200 Kelvin was more smaller than the vibrational energy and you win as the exponent there. That's going to allow us to change our, our black body absorption time from two seconds to 20 seconds. So uh, technology advances, physics advances, things we didn't used to have to worry about, we do have to worry about. Um, okay, question uh, coming up next is, can we do optical cooling to degeneracy? And um, in the, I would say that the, the most exciting era of optical cooling was in the 1980s, maybe early 1990s. Many new ideas were coming up. And the, the thought was that, well, why don't we just take atoms and laser cool them until they become, uh, they become degenerate, they become a Bose condensate. That, I, I don't say that's impossible. There are experiments which at least have uh, approximated that, um, that ideal, but you can see why it's difficult. Um, well, we, let's see why it's difficult to do. Uh, we know that P Sisyphus is equal to a few times uh, the recoil energy. Another way of saying it is that the thermal momentum of the atoms is equal to a few times the momentum of the photon. And that means that the Royally wavelength of the atom is equal to the wavelength of our photon divided by a few, maybe the square root of a few, which is still a few in my mathematics. Uh, we know that to get a Bose-Einstein condensate, we need the interparticle spacing, the density to the minus one third, that's the interparticle spacing. We need that to be comparable to the uh, thermal de Broglie wavelength. That's when Bose-Einstein condensation happens. So basically what we're asking for is we need to have, we need to be able to do our laser cooling in a regime where the interparticle spacing is comparable to uh, the wavelength of the photon, something less than that. So the problem becomes we have an atom, we have a photon coming in. We want the photon to bounce off of the atom and make the atom colder. But we have another atom here the distance between the two atoms is less than the wavelength of light. And so we have resonant exchanges of photons between these. Um, this is an oversimplification. There are many process that, processes that happen when you try to do laser cooling at high atomic density. Uh, and those processes are fascinating and people spent a lot of time studying them. From the point of view of someone who doesn't care about laser cooling and all you want to do is cool your atoms to Bose-Einstein condensation, those processes are not fascinating, those processes are bad. 
And so uh, generically, there are uh, randomly fluctuating forces between atoms close to each other, and there's also loss processes. And so uh, it's still the case that we very rarely do laser cooling. It's very difficult to do laser cooling all the way to degeneracy. And instead, we rely on evaporation. We do cooling to get the atoms cold enough. And then, uh, where is my cursor? And then uh, we do evaporation. I don't propose to say very much about evaporative cooling today, just because I can't talk about everything. But this combination of laser cooling, actually usually two different kinds of laser cooling for most experiments, followed by evaporation is, is more or less the standard route to Bose-Einstein condensation. I'm gonna take a little technical detour. Um, so evaporation, laser cooling followed by evaporation, good, it works very well, but it's large volume, um, takes, you know, many, many, many like sort of liters of space. Um, it's complicated, it's expensive, it's slow. Uh, we're told that VECs are going to be very useful and quantum information is going to be very useful and maybe ultra cold atoms is a way to quantum information. Can we make VEC small, cheap, fast? Um, and as for small, we need a couple of different things to make them small. We, we need our magnetic traps small and that's not too bad. Uh, people have, made magnetic traps, which are the wires that generate the magnetic traps are patterned on top of chips. There are little tiny wires here. The dimensions of the wires, um, wires can be uh, a few microns in, in uh, diameter and spacing. So it's possible to use the standard high-tech methods of, of miniaturization to make your Magnetic traps are very small. So the problem is not the magnetic traps. The problem is the, is the laser cooling. And uh, basically we start with, um, we start with atoms, rubidium atoms, for instance, with a thermal velocity of maybe 200 meters per second at uh, 300 Kelvin. And we have to start at 300 Kelvin because if we start any colder, there's no vapor pressure or rubidium. And this is generically true across atoms. Your atoms are going to start hot and they're going to start with high velocity. And then you can, you can decelerate them using laser forces. But uh, the, you know, the force, the maximum force you can get is going to be something like the spontaneous emission rate times the momentum that you scatter with each photon. And if you work that out, it works out to five times 10 to the four meters per second, which was, that's, I guess that's 5,000 times the acceleration of gravity. 5,000 times the acceleration of gravity, it sounds like a lot of acceleration. And certainly it would be very hard if you were a person accelerating at 5,000 times. But if you're traveling at, uh, at 200 meters per second, the distance it takes to stop is about uh, 0 0.5 meters. So that's a very big distance. That's not that's not a that's not a macro. That's not a something you can put inside your cell phone. Um, and even uh, so, what you end up finding out, even if you, uh, for instance, in MOTS where you have laser beams, the laser beams are crossing each other, and the diameter of the laser beams is perhaps two centimeters, maybe a little bit larger. Uh, for uh, if you have if you want to enforce the time to stop as two centimeters then uh, your sort of maximum velocity works out to about 20 meters per second. And if we look at a 300 Kelvin, this is uh, the flux of atoms versus the velocity. Uh, 20 meters per second is a very small, very small fraction of the, avail of, uh, the available atoms. And two centimeters is not what I would really call macroscopic. Um, we need to, if you really want to, sorry, microscopic. If you want, if you, if your vision is, I'm going to have a, a really small thing. Suppose you had your your laser beams. Uh, suppose your laser beams you were using for your cooling were only two millimeters in diameter. All this assumes, by the way, that electronics are cheap and small and getting cheaper and smaller. Lasers, even lasers are now solid state, very cheap, very small, but there's some physical limitations. 
a two millimeter laser for a two millimeter laser the uh, the maximum velocity you could stop goes from um, is now only seven meters per second and seven meters per second is a very very small region of the this is the flux and this is the uh, velocity of the atom a very very small region is at seven meters per second and as you go from as you go from 20 meters per second down to seven meters per second, you know, the flux, the flux goes down a factor of 30. So you see right away that you're not able to capture very many atoms. It's a pity, but uh, this result is uh, basically the, the result of a 59 year old guy towards the end of his career in ultra cold atoms. Uh, you folks should solve this problem and make, you know, miniaturized laser cooling. People have made some effort at, at this and they've actually been able to make, you know, BEC machines small enough that they can send them up in the, in the space station, you know, the International Space Station and make condensates up there. But, you know, it's still pretty big. You know, the thing is the size of, uh, uh, I don't, you know, in, in, in the U.S., some people in college dormitories have very small refrigerators for keeping their beer, beer cold. It's larger than that refrigerator. <laughs> it's maybe smaller than the refrigerator you have in a kitchen. Okay. Um, I'm not going to talk about it because I see that time is moving along, but uh, an alternative to evaporative cooling uh, is tweezers. And as I see, my understanding of my understanding of tweezers is that one of the primary advantages of do, using sort of doing sideband cooling and, and cooling in tweezers is that it's much much faster than evaporation, and you can um, do experiments with a repetition rate which is much much faster than an evaporation. And if you're trying to do some sort of many uh, quantum many body many and many atom entanglement experiment. In order to do the experiments, you have to do some sort of quantum tomography where you change a lot of different things and do many, many measurements and sort of across many dimensions of changing things. So you need to be able to do a very large number of experiments and a typical Bose-Einstein quantum station experiment, which has a repetition rate somewhere between a few seconds up to even a few minutes, that would take a long time. These tweezer experiments, the repetition rate is much, much faster, a tiny fraction of a second. So I think that's, uh, I guess you're hearing from Antoine these days. I don't know if it's something which he emphasized but it's uh, one of the reasons I think that tweezers are becoming so popular these days. Speed. Yet we don't have time to waste anymore. Okay, that's about all I propose to talk about, about in terms of cooling and trapping and so on. I'm about to switch gears and talk about um, uh, something called the gross Podieski equation, which is how we understand uh, ultra-cold atoms and how we model ultra-cold, in particular Bose-Einstein condensates. So I'm gonna pause here to see if there are questions about anything I've said yesterday or today having to do with cooling or trapping. Obviously this could be a semester long course, but I just picked a few things out of it that I thought would be interesting, um, hopefully even for the theorists. Um, yeah, so one question is, I always thought that one starts with a Zeeman slower, which is around one meter. How can one get rid of the Zeeman slower in the process of cooling? And uh, we just do here in Angela, uh, I don't use, I've never used the Zeeman slower. Um, the way you get around with using a Zeeman, get away from using a Zeeman slower is that you have uh, laser beams that cross and uh, maybe the laser beams are maybe three centimeters in diameter. And uh, the hot atoms come uh, that are traveling around, we don't have a, a beam, we just have a vapor. So. We take inside inside our vacuum chamber, you have a little pile of rubidium, which is uh, outgassing. So the vacuum chamber is filled with 300 Kelvin rubidium atoms. And remember 300 Kelvin doesn't necessarily mean 300 Kelvins of energy. It means a thermal distribution. And some of the atoms have, uh, this is a terrible font size here, has a, some of the atoms have 20 meters per second energy or less. And those, and those atoms come into our laser beams and are stopped. You can think of it as a, a slower, a Zeeman slower, which is only three centimeters long. 
Um, it's not really, a, it's not a super efficient way, but rubidium atoms are cheap. So at least 300 Kelvin rubidium atoms are cheap. You buy them from a, a chemistry store. So uh, that doesn't work so well with sodium and certainly doesn't work well with the refractory metals. Not really a science question, but do you think there will be a substantial market for small BEC machines for QI protocols or primary photonic, ionic, or superconducting platforms? Um, I don't think, okay. I don't think there's gonna be a substantial market for any kind of quantum information. <laughs> Wait, did I say that aloud? Anna Maria, cover your eyes, cover your ears. <laughs> so no, I don't think there will be a substantial market for BECs, but I feel like we have to try. And we could be we could be delightfully surprised, and if we are surprised, well, we, we might want to have a cold, low, low temperature bees, um, but conveniently small BECs. That's sort of a depressing comment. I'm sorry I said that aloud. Uh, is it theoretically possible to beat the Carnot limit with an intense cooling beam? So interaction with the photons from the cooling beam is more likely than with the black body photons. Um, I don't know, you know, the problem is that, uh, you know, the Carnot limit is itself a sort of theoretical idea and it's very, it's very, um, I was making fun of it, but I was, I was doing so in jest. Uh, you know, if you can beat the Carnot limit, uh, then you have the option of basically beating the second law of thermodynamics. And, um, you know, beating the second law of thermodynamics is just a hard way to earn a living. No one is, I mean, you can make a living beating the second law of thermodynamics, but only by, by lying to people. There's actually in, in the US a large industry of people who sell stock, you know, shares of companies that are based on beating the second law of thermodynamics and they make money, but they only make money by taking, taking it from gullible people. This is not really a, a physics argument, yeah, but I, I would say that I don't, know, I don't know your particular idea and I'd be interested in looking at it, but I will say that generically it's really hard to beat the Carnot limit. Uh, it's really, it's just uh, unfortunate. Uh, an obvious attempt to solve the mini BEC problem is to make atom mirrors to increase the effective path length of warm atoms in the cooling region. Yeah, so um, atom mirrors is a great idea. So atoms, atoms can come and hit a surface and bounce off of the surface and back and forth. Most atom mirrors that I know about work for atoms whose temperatures are already very, very low, already 20 microkelvin, 200 microkelvin. Uh, half a Kelvin, maybe, or something like that. It's I don't I don't know of any atom mirrors which are small and able to turn around an atom which has an energy of you know a course of, of hundreds of Kelvin or you know traveling at hundreds of meters per second. Uh, so I don't I don't rule it out. Um, but it's it would that would be that would be the technology you'd want to devise. And by the way, if you can make an atom mirror that can turn a two hundred meter atom around in a way which is um, uh, conservative in energy, like you can't allow the atom to hit the surface, thermalize with the surface and bounce off. So there's some sort of conservative potential which can stop an atom going that fast in a very short distance. But that's a long step, long step towards going to what you want to do. So although it hasn't been tried yet, I encourage you. More of a perspective question, what new experiments and regimes would be unlocked, immediately unlocked by new cooling schemes? Do you think they are available with advances in lasers or evaporative cooling or do we need novel approaches? Uh, I don't have a great answer for that. Um, I, I uh, unlocked by new cooling schemes. Um, do we need novel approaches? I, um, uh, you know, any ex it, to the extent a lot of you know experimenters spend a lot of their time making the atoms cold, trapping them, sorting them out, manipulating them. To the extent that these uh, these new methods are uh, not just better, but cheaper, easier, faster, simpler, more reliable, maybe available turnkey from a company that would just help the smart people in this business spend more time doing the, the more uh, advanced things. So take any kind of question people are answering. If you had like uh, uh, cooling, I mean, this, by better, I don't necessarily mean somehow higher performance in some high-tech measurement. I tend to mean easier, simpler, cheaper, smaller. Um, but I don't have a particular experiment that I would take out in this direction. We have lots of questions. And in a second, I want to move on. I have seen papers claiming to beat Carnot by doing non-equilibrium stuff, I believe. I believe you. I don't I, I, You know, you get out of the non-equilibrium limit, you can do all sorts of crazy things. Did you actually cool the lab from 300 Kelvin down to 200 Kelvin? 
we get the factor of 10 and time scale absorbing the black body photons. We did not, we did not cool the lab, but we cooled the vacuum chamber. Uh, it's a pity that this experiment, this, uh, this summer school is not being held, is being held remotely because if it was held in the, in the auditorium where it's usually held, I would invite you after this talk to walk up two flights of stairs and 50 meters to the left. And I would show you, it's quite a large experiment. It's uh, the vacuum chamber is, is 30 centimeters in diameter and over a meter long. And it's wrapped in um, the same sort of foam that the, the builders put underneath of the, the rafters and the roof. It's wrapped in, in uh, 30 centimeters thick of foam. And then there's a solid state cooler which cools the entire chamber from 300 Kelvin, yes, down to 180 Kelvin. It only, it only first started working uh, a few, uh, few months ago. We were in the process of, of building that for exactly this reason. But we have a, we need, our experiment requires a very large volume. So we had to devise our, build our own refrigerator. Uh, fun fact, there are some very nice results on making small MOTs. They use a grating and a single Zeeman fluorobene. If I recall correctly, their idea is to use it as a vacuum cage. So that sounds cool. And you see there's a link there. So people should go have a look. Okay, I'm gonna spend a little time talking about, uh, uh, I'm going to spend a little time talking about uh, the Rospitevsky equation, basically, how we think about condensates. Suppose we've now, so I've skipped over a lot of stuff. We've made a condensate and we want to understand how the condensate moves, what the condensate And uh, we're modern atomic physicists, so obviously we want to use a, a, a Schroeder equation. So we'll, let's write down the Schroeder equation. Up here is the Schroeder equation, it's a many body Schroeder equation. Uh, for the, you know, there's basically it has uh, N, if I have 1 million atoms in my condensate, then I have 1 million uh, coordinate vectors describing the location of every atom. And then I have a complex amplitude about this psi is a single complex number. And that complex number describes the complex amplitude for me to find uh, an atom in each of these locations at some time T. And this, uh, this amplitude, this uh, many, many dimensional wave function uh, evolves according to the many body Schroeder equation. There's a kinetic energy term. If the atoms are in some sort of confining potential, there's a con uh, confining term. And most int intriguingly, there's interactions. I've limited, this is already a very difficult equation and I've limited it to looking only at two body interactions, explicit uh, and not included explicit uh, higher, like, you know, terms that involve from, involve from three atoms simultaneously interacting. Those terms are actually usually pretty small in the regime we work in. So then uh, basically every, every pair of atoms undergoes a, has some, in our case, we know it's a van der Waals attraction. And I've simplified, I haven't thought about the different spin levels. This is already considerably simplified. Uh, and then that's multiplied, of course, times the wave function. This is a many body shortage equation, already quite some, somewhat simplified because we don't include different uh, Zeeman and hyperfine levels and so on, but uh, quite intractable. But, the standard way of solving this is you assume that the atoms are not microscopically correlated. You treat the interactions as a mean field. Um, and you replace uh, the two body interaction, which we know has some sort of uh, at long range. It has a one over R6 attraction. At short range, there's a, a repulsive wall. We replace that with a, a point contact uh, <coughs> interaction, a, a zero range interaction. Uh, with a coefficient which is given by this by the scattering length here. Um, I believe that this method is essentially in spirit um, what the condensed matter physicists would call Hartree Fock. Leo, do you want to hold that? Do you want to where, where, do you want to do you want to have an opinion about that? I don't know. Anyway. Uh, well, uh, I would say this is Hartree. I mean, what uh yeah, I would say this I, is. I, a, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know any condensed matter physics, so I, I'm not mocking. But anyway, we, we make these approximations and then we do a sort of a. Can, can I make a comment on that? Way. Yes. Because I think there are two points here, right? So, so I agree the first approximation of making the Gross Pidievsky looks like Hartree. Um, but but the other approximation that u looks like a delta function is in some ways well it depends you're, you're doing Hartree on the pseudo potential which actually includes all the two body scattering processes to infinite right. order. Okay, yeah, I, I, that's right. The Hartree Fock doesn't necessarily have that delta function term, right? Because it's yeah. yeah. If you were to naively do Hartree Fock, you, you still might get a delta function, but it might be uh, with the wrong coefficient. Yeah. 
So. Okay. So then we write our many body wave function as the product of one body wave function. It's the same wave function. Again, this psi is the same wave function again and again, evaluated at the location of all the different, um, all the different atoms and just multiplied together. This psi is sometimes called the gross Titayevsky wave function and it obeys the gross Titayevsky equation. Uh, Eric, you have a question about that, um, but this particular restrictive Hartree approximation because it has a trivial determinant. Maybe the question is about fermions versus bosons. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. Um, when someone says it has a trivial yes, here, determinant. Here, here we have bosons and we don't have to deal with Hartree determinants at all. Mm -hmm. okay, well, it's, okay. it's a comment. It's just a comment. Okay. okay. I, I, I regret opening up myself to charges of, of, of terrible ignorance in, in condensed matter, because you can see already I'm backpedaling. I should never have said that. <laughs> um, this is the gross Titayevsky equation. This equation that governs the, the dynamic of this, it's uh, this, this single, uh, call it an order parameter, if you like, it's, it's kind of, and uh, the, the order parameter is normalized such that if you uh, take its, its uh, Square modulus, you get the density, and that's the density you see here in this interaction term. Um, so this is the gross Pitayevsky equation. It's amazingly accurate um, and amazingly successful. If, if you take A to be the S-wave scattering length between the atoms, it's astonishing the all the experiments that have been done that have tested this to a great degree of, of quantitative accuracy. It's the product uh, dating back to 1961 of, of uh, E.P. Gross and Lev Pitayevsky when uh, Lev Pitayevsky was a, a, a youngish man, not much older than the students here. Gross was about 10 years older. I don't know very much about E.P. Gross. He died a young man and I never, not a young, not a young man, but he died at a relatively young age uh, in his early 60s and uh, I never met him. He died shortly before Bose-Einstein condensation happened. Uh, Lev Pitayevsky developed this equation because he wanted to have some way of modeling uh, vortices and superfluid helium. So he said, well, let's sort of, you know, Superfluid helium, it's a liquid, but we need some sort of equation so we can model vor vortex lines in, in rotating superfluid helium. And so he kind of said, let's model Bose-Einstein condensation, sorry, let's model superfluid liquid helium as a Bose-Einstein condensation, which was considered actually a little bit, I don't know if controversial is the right word, just like ridiculously oversimplified maybe, <laughs> um, but it was a, a successful in like modeling th things you see with vortices, including the fact that it forms lattices and so on. Um, this was in 1961. He went out and did, did other things, including uh, writing uh, books with uh, Landau and Lifshitz and so on. Uh, and then uh, 35 years later, I guess, uh, Bose-Einstein condensation happened and he got back into the field in a big way and uh, has written since then written many papers on it. Um, so it's a, something of a point of pride for me that I, I, I actually wrote a few papers with him in roughly when, when he was about 70. Uh, uh, if I if I make exception for the uh, University of Colorado uh, faculty, uh, Lev is my my favorite Russian theorist. <laughs> uh, uh, Thank very, you, Eric. Very very pleasant uh, and uh, humorous guy, um, and uh, now almost ninety, but living in Italy. Um, I should just emphasize that the gross Pitayevsky equation looks like a Schrodinger equation, but it's not. Uh, the gross Pitayevsky wave function is an order parameter. It's not a quantum wave function. Quantum mechanics is linear, right? If we go back to the original uh, many body wave function, this is a linear wave function. There's no, you know, everything is linear in psi. Um, the gross Pitayevsky equation is not linear, right? This, this term here, n, is proportional to psi squared. So this is a nonlinear equation in psi. It sort of makes it look like. Uh, somehow these atoms are self-interacting or something. It's not, this is just a way of representing the interactions between atoms in the, in the condensate. Um, and there's not actually anything nonlinear from a quantum mechanical point of view going on. Although of course the fluid evolves as if it's a nonlinear fluid. It is actually an interacting fluid, self-interacting fluid. Um, and in, I would say in the late 1990s, this, um, this sort of late 1990s, early 2000s, this, this way, this sort of uh, quantitative treatment for condensates was like embarrassingly successful. Like we, you know, it got to a point where people would say, why are you doing, I mean, people did many, many experiments, you know, looking at various aspects of the condensate, showing that it obeyed the gross Pitayevsky equation. And eventually, you know, I started thinking like, why are we doing these experiments? You know, we should do experiments that violate the gross Pitayevsky equation. 
Uh, we need to get out of this regime. <laughs> um, uh, so, sorry for this. This, this is just what I, this is the gross pidievsky equation. Um, we can solve this in various approximations. Here's the gross pidievsky equation again. Uh, in the Thomas Fermi e e approximation, we ignore uh, the kinetic energy term. We ignore this term here and we look for stationary terms. So we ignore the um, kinetic energy term, we, we look for stationary terms which aren't involving in time. And we get something where it looks like the, the wave function um, has a, uh, a density, uh, which is proportional to the difference between the chemical potential and V external. What this means is that the condensate, uh, the condensate sort of molds itself to form. Here we have a potential, and the condensate molds itself to form the inverse shape of the potential. So the potential is a parabola. The density of the condensate is an inverted parabola. And this is true more generally. If we have some sort of crazy, some sort of crazy potential, the density of the condensate is, I'm not going to get this right, is basically will be just the, the inverse of that. Um, this is in the this Thomas family uh, approximation. Basically, it's like a um, yeah, okay, so that's a, a great simplification. And using these things, you can, if you know how many atoms you have and what your scattering length is, you can sort of predict the shape of the condensate as it sits in the shape and size and details of the condensate as it sits in a box. Um, the, what else we can do? We can also, instead, we can include this kinetic energy term. That should be a grad squared and uh, ignore this external potential. And then if there's no external potential, then basically the condensate extends infinitely and we can look for uh, plane wave solutions. Which, I'm sorry, this should be grad squared here. Um, we can look for plane wave solutions to this, which is called the uh, Molyubov modes. And uh, if we look at the um, dispersion relationship, the energy of these modes as a function of K for low, mo low momentum modes, the uh, energy is linear in K, which if the energy if, of if K, if omega is linear in K, it means you have a fixed speed of sound. And for higher, higher momentum modes, this becomes parabolic. Uh, 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 dispersion relationship, which is parabolic and momentum is like a free particle. So uh, low momentum excitations look like sound waves. High momentum excitations look like free atoms. Uh, and the crossover is that this thing called the uh, one over the healing length, which is given by the chemical potential. Yeah. I have a question about the validity of the, the GP depending on the dimensionality. So if it's ah. valid, it would be young one B2. So I have, uh, I have a slide coming up very soon all about the uh, limits to the gross pit AFC equation. So I'm going to, I think what I will do is, is hold off and answer that question in two more slides. Um, these uh, sound wave modes um, uh, correspond uh, to some fluctuations in density, but they are more fluctuations in phase, local phase of the condensate. So they're um, sometimes called zero sound. Uh, if you have a condensate, suppose you have a condensate with some size, and then you have a, a, um, a standing wave phonon so the phonon has got two, two, uh, two nodes, and I have a phonon. There's going to be a mode of, of the phonon field, which is a standing wave inside this condensate. If I have a, uh, a, a, co a coherent occupation, if I have you know, hundreds or thousands of phonons all occupying this mode in a coherent way, basically, uh, I add, the, I add these two things together and I end up getting a, a condensate which breathes. It, it gets uh, uh, small and high density and low and low density. So this is a breathing, this is versus time. You get a breathing mode of the condensate. And actually it's by studying, one of the easiest ways to look at these phonons and understand the frequency of these phonons is to look at, you know, excite the uh, breathing modes of the condensates and see the condensates change in size. And these frequencies are at the energy difference between the condensate and this, this uh, second excited state of, of, a, of a, not the lowest order of phonon, but the second order of phonon allowable. Eric, there is also a question about terminology about the, the, the definition of the order parameter. And yes. is Let me there a different Yeah, so 
Yeah, if you have a, uh, okay, order parameter is a scary thing. When I say it, it means something very specific to Garen's matter physicists. And I see Leo there with his, with not himself, but his, his picture there, and I'm worried he's going to make fun of me. But it is true that there's not really a definition of a, of an order, like if the, if the, if the atoms are thermal, basically, so that it's basically a, a fully fluctuating Bose field, there's, there's not really an order parameter anymore. So um, there is a disorder phase and that's the, the non-condensate, but I'm a little nervous about this definition of a disorder phase. Um, and so I'm gonna quickly skip over it before anyone can correct me. Um, there was a question about limits to the gross pitayevsky equation. It does work. Um, kind of at low density, uh, sorry, low D, D is for dimensions. Yes, the gross Pitayevsky equation works at low density, but at finite temperature, which is say any temperature, uh, it does not, it does not uh, get the, I can gen generically at finite temperature, the gross Pitayevsky equation really isn't set up to deal with finite temperature. And so it gets uh, fluctuations in 2D and 1D, it tends to get these fluctuations wrong. Um, uh, if you have, I, I've talked about the breathing modes of the condensate. These modes are undamped at zero temperature, but at finite temperature, they eventually damp because of interactions with the thermal component of the cloud. That's something you can't really model in the gross Pitayevsky equation. Like so much, so much other mean field theory, it doesn't work near the critical temperature. And it doesn't work if the interactions are too strong. If I take the density times the scattering parameter cubed, people say, well, if Na cubed is larger than one, uh, a little more precise to say if it's larger than four pi. By the time any cube is four pi, one over four pi, things have fallen to pieces. Everything, uh, everything goes to hell. Um, and then there are uh, discrete, um, basically density fluctuations associated with the fact that the atom field, you know, the atoms are not a, not continuous. They're discrete atoms, and so obviously the density at the le atomic level is represented by little delta functions, which represent the location of the individual atoms. The gross Pitayevsky equation can't model that either. Um, here is a, here's a picture taken in the lab of Deborah Jin. Here's a, she took a photograph of a, uh, of a, actually this is not a condensate, but a, 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 a very cold cloud of, of fermions. And uh, then she subtracted from the shape, she subtracted, she fit the shape to a very smooth uh, parabolic density and subtracted that away from it. And then she looked at what was remaining, and you can see in the center of the cloud where there are where the atoms are, you have much higher density, sorry, much higher noise. And around the edges, you have low noise. Around the edges, this is the technical noise associated with the imaging. In the center, the noise is dominated by the fact that the atoms are discrete. This is not a picture imaging individual atoms, um, because that's very difficult to do in absorption. For unconfined atoms in, in absorption, it's very difficult to image individual atoms. This is uh, if I draw, this is really imaging the, uh, call it the shot noise, if I draw a little box here, and that's, a, I, I look into the column up there, if I imagine that there should be a thousand atoms inside and in in, in projected inside that, if I in, integrate along the line of sight, maybe there's supposed to be a thousand atoms, but it's going to be a thousand atoms plus or minus the square root of a thousand, and that's the, that's the noise that she's seeing there. So you can see, you can see 30 atoms. <laughs> You can't see one atom. So basically you're sort of seeing the, that, that noise there. This was a, uh, I thought a beautiful experiment leading into a lot of other interesting things that Debbie did. I see a lot of uh, chat, which I can't, I, I don't have enough mental bandwidth to uh, monitor. Anna Maria, please tell me if there's something I should address. Um, it's hard, okay, I mentioned that uh, NAQ, when NAQ gets to be larger than one over four pi, uh, things really fall apart. Even if any cubed is less than one over four pi, but not, not vanishing, there are perturbative corrections to the chemical potential known as the Li Huang Yang correction. So these are things that you can do, which can basically be folded into the gross Pitayevsky equation. But once it starts to get large, things sort of fall apart. It's very hard to start uh, to study strong interactions in atomic BEC because of three body recombination. I will say that I've made, a, I've made an effort to do that um, in my lab and um, uh, Zoran Hadzababich, um, that I uh, often I collaborate with has also done a lot of very interesting work in Bose condensates where the scattering length is suddenly made essentially infinite. You see how strange things happen. Um, but it's different for uh, fermions. If you have fermions, uh, say spin, call them nominally spin one half fermions, uh, you know that 
at least always at least two of the fermions will be pointing in the same direction. So if they're pointing in the same direction, fermions can't be very close to each other. Because of this, you, all, you could have three all in the same direction, but always at least two will be in the same direction. Because of this, three-body recombination is strongly suppressed. It's difficult to get three atoms close to each other. And so you can make Na cubed uh, arbitrarily large and formally infinite, although it, it's, uh, it basically gets renormalized by the density. But, and this is work that was done. Uh, we'll hear more about these things from the, um, in this, in this uh, later in this uh, talk, but it was uh, later in this, in this summer school. But uh, I think maybe the, uh, maybe, the, maybe the single most important pioneer in that field was the work of Betty Jin, who died at a very young age, but was, uh, uh, we we're very proud of her here. The, uh, all the various wonderful work she did, and we miss her very much. I think at this point, uh, I'm going to stop because I see it coming up on something over an hour uh, and see if there are questions. So there were a lot of discussion in the chat about the validity of 1D to 2D. A 3D and also the BKT transition from you go to two, in, in a two-dimensional gas. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you want to comment about that, Eric. I mean, there were a few discussions there. Mm -hmm. we have done, uh, we've done some work looking at the BKT transition um, here in, in JILA, University of Colorado. We didn't do it uh, in the perfectly uniform limit. We, we did it in a, a single plane, but the plane was a uh, uh, something like a lattice, you know, it was, it was built, it was broken into little pieces, which made, for various reasons, made the, the problem simpler for us. But you could see the breakdown of phase coherence as you made it hotter. You know, we studied that transition. Um, and other groups around the world have looked at that as well. Um, but, um, and that's true, uh, but I don't have, uh, at this point, I don't have other things to say about this. Yeah, there were have been other experiments in one dimensions when the people people reach what is called the tox gerador regime, where it start not to be valid, and you have to make the bosons behave like fermions. It's quite interesting regime too, um, but in quasi one D works well. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, I, I'm thinking of in particular of the experiments of Dave Weiss, where yeah. even uh, away from degeneracy. Uh, in 1D, two-body collisions don't thermalize, you know, and, and uh, so he was able to do a series of very interesting experiments showing that, uh, you know, basically, in, in essence, they never thermalize because, um, you know, you can, you can basically have collisions that look like the atoms passing right through each other or collisions that look like the atoms bouncing off each other without exchanging energy, but nothing in between. So uh, those, are, those were cool experiments, you know. <clears throat> The experiments are never truly 2D or, or never truly 1D, but there usually turns there usually tends to be some sort of parameter where it, which tells you good enough. And uh, a lot of experiments have been done in the good enough regime, or 2D regime, or good enough 1D regime. Yes, I imagine Ber Mera Parish is going to tell us a little bit about the importance of the scattering length, the magnitude of the scattering length confined compared to the confinement and what the people call feedback geometric. A feedback resonance or confinement uh, in resonance. So maybe you, you will hear about uh, later today, actually, maybe. Yeah, she does beautiful stuff. So that's something to look forward to. And of course, uh, to look at strong interactions, you have to ask strong compared to what? And usually, I guess we're talking about the kinetic energy here, right? So the other route to making strong interactions is to reduce your kinetic energy, which is exactly what people do with optical lattices and things. And so we'll also hear about that shortly in the school. So, yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so, what is the minimum distance you can get away from Gross Pityevsky, and you think it's still interesting? Right. So you mentioned thermal fluctuations, but uh... um, I, oh, I, I think the. I think the Li Huang Yang correction is interesting. You know, it's not a trivial result, is my understanding. And see, measuring that quantitatively, there have been experiments that have seen it. They tend to be sort of relatively low precision. 
uh, and corrections on top of that. Uh, you uh, Obviously, you get much higher than that. The corrections become non universal, but I, I don't think that necessarily means not interesting. In the early days when Leo and I first met, he told me that if something wasn't universal, it wasn't interesting. So we had to extend some numbers that. Um, in my defense, I, uh, I have I think that long ago changed my mind, but uh, um, and plus I, 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 I don't think I've said it exactly that way. He, he, he didn't say it that way. And, and, and in support of Leo, I've now come to realize how very, very interesting it is to be able to put a bunch of results together and show that they all show the same thing in, in, a, in, a, in a universal or quasi-universal way. So I think that we've almost trade places at this point. <laughs> At this point, Leo thinks that every single box of the periodic table is a field of study unto itself. And I think, nah, I don't, I don't believe that. <laughs> Eric, I mean, uh, following up on uh, Caden's comment and question, uh, what about in the tails of the of your cloud, you know, where the density is uh, going pretty low? There's, you know, one can make arguments and, you know, uh, that you know, there you really, both thermal and quantum fluctuations begin to matter. And uh, yeah, and I, I don't know if people have looked in those tails or maybe it's too difficult to do experiments with so few atoms uh, or, you know, where you're sort of, the focus of your system is so small, but. Uh, you know, uh, you know, the way I always thought about it is that uh, the, usually people often will talk about if you have a parabolic potential and you put atoms into it, they talk about sort of a global critical temperature. Right. But you can also sort of like divide your experiment up into any little cubes and say right. the critical temperature is a local function of the local density. And um, as you get closer to the edge of the condensate, and indeed as you get exactly at the edge of the condensate, you're right at the critical temperature, right at the local critical temperature. So yeah, I agree. Um, to me, that always struck me as a, a place which would be really cool it's hard to get much signal to noise there if you have even the smallest little bit of a optical diffraction off of your much dense, much denser condensate. You know, you get some little wiggle down there that you start to study and you realize, no, that's just the fact that my lens isn't very good. And I'm seeing some, some you know, if you take a picture of a dark thing, oftentimes around the edges with a coherent light source, like a laser, oftentimes around the edges, you see little wiggles, which are, you know, from a physics point of view, boring. They're just, you know, optics, imperfect optics effect. So I've never been able, we were never able to, to see cool things there. We have looked, um, but maybe people smarter than me could figure it out. Um, the, I think, uh, yeah. go ahead. I was just gonna say, even the simplest thing is like, you know, sort of the crudest level, and I made these arguments long, long ago, but I've never followed up, uh, you know, you take your gross potential equation, you minimize it, and you get a profile and some potential, right? And you're trapped. Yeah. And you get an answer. Yeah. But, you know, but really what you should be doing, let's say at finite temperature, setting it equal to not to zero, but to KBT, you know, roughly speaking, you know, that it, it's really, you know, if you think of psi as a fluctuating quantity and it's sitting in some exponential in the Boltzmann factor, really the contributions of psi are coming from not that thing being zero, you know, the uh, your kernel of your gross potential equation, but really being on the order of KBT. Hmm. So that, you know, so that you can tell, you can then uh, show that there's a non-trivial crossover from setting it equal to zero to setting equal to KBT. That happens in the tails. So, it's, so there's a temperature dependent modification of the shape of the tails uh, of yeah. the cloud uh, uh, as compared to just simply solving, you know, gross Pitaevsky equation in the trap. Um, so anyway, so these are kind of things I was thinking yeah. of, but perhaps again, it's maybe uh, too difficult to go after uh, experimentally just because it happens in the tails only. I remember Leo, you and I were at one time worried about, uh, we, we spent a lot of time, Leo and I spent a lot of time looking at vortex lattices. Uh, so mm -hmm. we, spin the, we spin the cloud very, very rapidly. As you spin it more and more rapidly, the cloud expands, the density goes down. As the density goes down, the size of the vortex cores get larger. 
And mm-hmm. I sort of asked myself, like, is there is there thermal fluid living inside the vortex cores? You know? Right, right. And yeah, I feel this is a related topic. It's sort of at you know the, the vortex core is again sort of like at the edge of the condensate, you know, except this is right. at the inner edge of the condensate. The um, you know, Zoran Hadzababich and I guess others have now done the experiments where instead of having a parabolic confinement, they have a, a square well confining, which means they can look, they can have the whole sample relatively close to the critical temperature instead of just having the edge at the critical temperature. And has studied in particular, studied uh, interaction driven changes in the critical temperature, uh, which are, uh, remember, I don't even remember which way they go, actually. <laughs> the critical temperature is not what you think it is. I think it might actually be a slightly higher critical temperature than you otherwise expect, which is not, not intuitive to me uh, in, a, in a flat bottom box. Um, he, he has seen those effects. So. He might also Jan Dalibari. I think he has a very nice set of experiments in, in a flat. Or is, I don't know if they're related, but, but Jan too, yes? Yeah. I'm trying to explain all these I different things. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Goran and Jean are always, it's, you know, you can, you can take a train to go from one lab to the other, or two trains. I tried to do that. I took the train from Cambridge, England, to trying to go to Paris, France, and I got to uh, the train station in London, and they wouldn't get me on, let me get on the train without a passport. I'm going like, what? This is a train. This is like the subway. You don't need to show, you don't need to show a subway. You don't need to show a passport in a subway. But they sent me away. I had to go all the way back to Cambridge, England, get my passport, and come back again. So it took me oh, like all day, all day to go from these two world capitals, which are separated only by 150 miles or something. Eric, getting back to, can I uh, ask you a question about? Uh, it's maybe cl- just clarification. Uh, you started your talk when you discussing Sisyphus cooling. Yeah, and you made this comment: Sisyphus cooling is the same as polarization cooling for all practical purposes. But and then you proceeded to describe polarization cooling. What is Sisyphus cooling? Just to yeah. get the terminology straight. Oh shit! I was hoping you weren't going to ask that. Um, Wait, or uh, maybe so, maybe the answer is it is the same, and that's it. It's not for all practical purposes. I okay. So like. Um, Sort of in the early 1990s, which was like, uh, sorry, late 1980s, early 1990s, which was sort of like the most exciting time in this, uh, small differences in cooling techniques had their own names. Um, and I, I, I actually, I can't reconstruct. Uh, maybe what I've told you was polarization gradient cooling, but um, I, I can't reconstruct it. Okay, sorry about that's that. Fair. It's not, it's not very different. I'll put it that way. Um, okay. It involves moving you know, M almost changing in energy, spontaneous decay, you know, the sort of non, non-adiabatic events which take away energy. Mm-hmm. Um, so is there a version of it without spin, involving spin? Um, or you have uh, to have like two states or something, right? Or There's a thing called blue molasses, um, which is, uh, again, uh, then now you have the laser beam to tune blue and under certain circumstances, you can get cooling there. And it was the hottest thing in 1980, or something like that. Right. I remember being, uh, but this I, is I like can't... an IEIT, like a EIT system, like, like three levels. Um, so you, I, 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 I simply don't remember. It was, I, you know, at the time it was the thing I was most interested in the world. And then evaporative cooling came along about 25 years ago, 27 years ago. And I never, Seriously thought about laser cooling again, <laughs> um, but uh, that doesn't mean that there are people continue to work in it and, and advances have happened. For instance, there's this now thing called gray molasses, um, which is the hottest, in fact, turns out to be very interesting, useful technologically in terms of like, a future to do um, evaporative cooling and so on. And everyone uses gray molasses. And again, I'd be, I mean, this is embarrassing, but I'd be hard pressed to explain exactly how gray molasses works or what it is. So um, you, well, you, hire some, you, you hire someone who's 59 years old to be your lecturer and you can't be disappointed if it turns out they're a little behind the times. 
Well, let me, so can I just ask the terminology? Uh, I've gone to Wikipedia, the arbiter of truth, and it says uh, Sisyphus, cool, Sisyphus cooling, sometimes called polarization gradient cooling, is a dot, dot, dot. So, okay. Synonyms, I guess. So, so let me ask Eric, uh, you know, specifically about polarization gradient cooling. Uh, what is, I missed one element of it. Do you you have to flip the spin or what what hap, how do you flip from the from the one curve to the next curve from you know one spin state it's, to the it's other? It's an optical pumping event. So um, this here, this is the ground state. Up here is the excited state. So there's a very large energy difference between these. Oh, if I the see. atom is here and the photons are going this way, the atom will go up here. The atom can come back down, which is a oh. no-op. Or it can come down here. Oh, Once it comes okay. down here, it will stay here forever because it can only go up here and this state can only come down here. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And um, so it stays here until the atom has moved far enough in the polarization gradient that the polarization, the helicity of the lasers change sign. Now this atom, so this atom is no longer stuck in this state. It will get excited to here, could come back down, or it could come this way. Once it's here, it will stay here. So that picture I drew that looked sort of like a discontinuous event, that corresponded to an absorption this way and a decay that way. That's, that gives you that discontinuous, that, that discontinuous event between the energy curves for this is the, this is the M equal one half, right. one half. This is the M equal minus one half. That discontinuous event is absorbing photon and then emitting in a different, in a different helicity or a different polarization. I see, I see. But, but how do you control, how do you tune that that happens when you're at the top of the hill? Like what is the knob? It there? doesn't have to happen. It, what you know is that it won't happen at the bottom of the hill. Okay. And as you come higher and higher up, it becomes more and more likely. Okay, so there's a distribution. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. And it can go the wrong way. Um, like it could happen here. It could, uh, it starts, it could, it, in principle, it could jump once it's moved away from the bottom. It could go up here, and as the um, by ch by by changing the intensity of the laser and the detuning of the laser, you can change the various rates for this optical pumping to occur. You know, the optimal thing is you'd like the time for pumping to occur to be sort of comparable to the time it takes to go all the way up to the top of the next mountain. <laughs> of course, you've got a thermal distribution. Some are going to be going faster, some slower. Um, Mm -hmm. Modeling the whole thing involving all the different, especially in 3D, but even in one day, modeling all the different velocity classes is uh, is difficult. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, this was the uh, interestingly, this was this this was not a theoretical prediction. This was discovered in Bill Phillips' lab when he was thought. Well, everyone knows that the lowest possible temperature is the Doppler limit. I'm going to study the Doppler limit. And he, and, he, and he discovered that his atoms were getting much colder than the Doppler limit. And it took him a long time. It took him a long time to believe it and everyone else a long time to believe him. Um, but it was, first of all, it just, it goes against all laws of experimental physics. There's laws of theoretical physics like the Carnot. The laws of experimental physics are experiments always work worse than they're supposed to. And here's an experiment that worked better than it was supposed to. A total violation of the laws of experimental physics. And those, are, those laws are very seldom violated, but this was one of them. So then only then did they go back and come up with this story, which is a good story and in principle could have been told before the experiment, but it wasn't. Well, why did he create polarization gradient in the first place? He, he had the polarization gradient because he had a magneto-optical trap. So uh, his magneto-optical trap had laser beams with circular polarization coming in from opposite directions. Oh, um, and, and, that, and, and, that, and from all different directions. In order to study it, like the, you can do a much simpler experiment where you have 1D situation, laser beam coming in vertically polarized from this side, horizontally polarized from this side, then you have this extremely much, much simplified version. And they did experiments like that, you know, showing, oh, it's actually quite a bit, uh, we get much cold, like the, and they could, for those sorts of things, you can at least get a reasonable model for how cold it should get. So for the actual, scientific study, if you like, of polarization gradient cooling, you have these simplified, polar, and, and that's the simplified version I showed you, but it's not really what usually happens, uh, nor is it how it was discovered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks.
Well, okay, if there are, are there any other questions? Otherwise we're getting towards the end uh, or have gone to the end. So I'll, I'll pause, any other questions? Okay, uh, then you can, yeah, to, go ahead. Sorry, do you mind? I wanted to ask one more question about the uh, gross uh, yeah. equation. Well, when, when deriving it, the way I see it, you made two major uh, kind of assumptions. One was the, um, the fact that you only had pairwise interactions. And then the second was kind of the, the factorization of the wave function to a single particle wave function, which is the same for all particles. So I was wondering if you wanted to make kind of a um, better gross Pitevsky equation kind of to, to, which would have less of the limitations where would you start? So what is kind of the main thing that gives you limitations? Is it the pairwise interactions or is it the factorization of the wave function? Where do you see that, that coming from? I think it's not, it's not the pairwise interactions. That's a surprisingly robust assumption to really do very, I think it's the factorization of the wave function. As you go to uh, higher interaction strengths, uh, you, really need to write, you need to write a wave function um, that looks like uh, sorry. Basically, a, a real many-body wave function, a second quantized. Well, you, can, you can do it. You can do it bit by bit. You can write it as a wave function, which looks like, you know, the product of um, psi r, you know, plus the product over, you know, of uh, psi r i minus r j or something like that. You can. You can add, you can, you can do some sort of expansion where you add two body interactions, two body correlations and three body correlations. You can, I think it's called a, I think it's called a cluster expansion. And yeah, but what will you have? I mean, many people, you have, you replace the field operator by a C number by a small correction and you keep the small corrections on to first order. That, that's one way to go beyond. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, I think that all, all of the, all of the, where you first notice it breaking down, most of these you can describe as being a, a failure of the assumption that that cloud, the atom locations are uncorrelated microscopically. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, can I ask about that? So what about FMOV, Eric? I would have thought that this is in some sense a breakdown of the pairwise pseudo potential. Yeah, but it isn't. Um, and FMOV is, uh, FMOV states, are perfectly well described. The, the, if I look at the three body, the total interaction energy, it's described as the, it is very, it's quite accurately described as the sum of the, of the three potentials. Uh, if I'm looking at it as an honest to God uh, Vanderbilt's potential, if instead yeah, of, exactly. if, I, if, I, if, yeah, if I try if to I, use if this. I describe it as a delta function, yeah, okay, I take it back. Yeah, it, um, yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. You're completely correct. If I want to describe the, inter, uh, the, the interaction as a delta function interaction, then yeah, FMOF is a breakdown of that. It turns out it's not on the, on the if, I, if I have a, I actually can represent this as a sum of two body interaction, uh, more realistic two body interactions. Um, Jose Dincao and Chris Green, people like that have, have, have done these experiments, uh, these theory to, to great detail. It's entirely, it's, it's difficult, but tractable theory. Um, but, but there it turns out that the three body terms are really hard to see, like they're, they're like the explicitly three body terms. But yeah, what you said, uh, I yeah. think it's a good way of putting it. Like that's, it, it looks like the two body delta function potential is breaking down because in the FMOF, FMOF terms. But even at two body, Kaden, uh, Joseph Twyson has shown that even P wave interactions, the ratio of, of the potential can be fundamental. So in S wave, it's less important, but even for two body uh, with P wave interactions, he has recent experiments that show range corrections from the effective potential, the range of the potential can be even very important. Too. Is, this, is this the range of the potential or, or the free body? It, it, the range of the potential is just at okay. the two body, you have yeah. to include the corrections of the energy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is now a, a, a two body a correction. Uh, it's not a three body. It's a two body correction, exactly. but the momentum dependent correction. For the exactly. Two body exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And that is uh, another thing that can show up, and especially in, in uh, that can show up in bosons too. Uh, so basically, if the temperature is too high or uh, the density is too high well, for yeah. certain kinds of atoms, you can get. Um, Corrections uh, to the two body potential, which are still two body corrections, but mm -hmm. momentum or, or I guess well, it's it's replaced. 
Sorry? It's replacing the A by the scattering amplitude. Yes, exactly. A K-dependent scattering amplitude. Well, the T matrix. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. That's that's right. That's right. Okay, so maybe well, here uh, this is a good time to wrap up and uh, take a break. So we'll see you all at uh, four o'clock Boulder time for Mira Parrish's uh, talk uh, lecture on BCBCS uh, physics. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Enjoy the summer school, everybody. Enjoy the Thank you, school. Eric.